Convergent evolution is a fun thing to learn about. Thank you so much for bringing it up. Convergent evolution happens when two organisms evolve similar traits without sharing a common ancestor that also had that trait. So it's when different distinct organisms end up with the same types of adaptations because those adaptations work for both organisms. So a great example of this is flying. Birds fly, bats fly, insects fly, pterodactyls flew, which by the way, the word pterodactyl literally means wing fingers. They all fly or flew and they don't share a common ancestor that could fly. They all evolved flight totally independently in totally different ways using totally different genes. That is convergent evolution. They all converged on the same adaptations. What in the actual fuck is that? This is yet another animal that I absolutely love because they are super weird and so am I. That is called the two-toed amphiuma, otherwise known as the Louisiana ditch eel. What a horrible name. They're not eels. They're amphibians. They're salamanders. They have tiny, tiny little stumpy legs that you can barely even see. And they just slither around through fresh waters and mud banks looking for crustaceans and frogs and snakes and fish and bugs to nom upon. They grow to be about four feet long and they look like Lovecraftian nightmares hanging out in your backyard. And I love them for that. But they're harmless. They're not venomous. They're not poisonous. They will bite the crap out of you if you mess with them. But as long as you leave them alone, they're not going to do anything to you. And you can find them all along the southern and eastern banks of the United States. Ditch yields, everybody. The eye is a very common sticking point for people who don't understand evolution. I'm even told from time to time that Darwin himself admitted that the eye is so complex that it never could have possibly evolved. Which isn't what he said at all. And even if it was, you know we don't worship Darwin, right? Anyway, eyeballs aren't anything magical or mysterious. Remember, light exists independently of us, so all we're doing is developing an organ that can detect and utilize this resource that's already there anyway. So you start off with a patch of photosensitive cells. You can now detect light. Congratulations. Then you put a little dent in there. You can now tell which direction that light's coming from. And the deeper that dent is, the better it's going to work. So now you have this bowl-shaped eye. The smaller the opening is, the more resolution you're going to get. So now you have this pinhole camera eye, those are really cool, and then all you have to do is slap a little lens on the front, you can now adjust the focus, and you have an eyeball. Not only have eyes evolved multiple times independently of each other, but you can see every single one of these stages in living organisms today. Eyes are not a mystery. Tell me something that's an absolute flex to a niche group but means nothing to the majority. I am really, really good at removing the skin from human cadavers. Like, really good. Fastest and cleanest that my professors had ever seen. Natural talent, is what I'm told. The only times that I could think that bragging about this would be beneficial would be to impress other people that studied human anatomy, or maybe to get out of a bar fight. You got The solvents for the ink in the Sharpie are also dissolving the glove ever so slightly, weakening it and causing it to bulge under the air pressure. And that's why you don't wear gloves like that when handling other solvents like, say, acetone, because it will dissolve the glove. And that's why you can use things like acetone or rubbing alcohol to remove permanent marker, because it dissolves the ink in the exact same way. And that's why you can also remove permanent marker using a non-permanent marker. If you ever accidentally draw on a whiteboard using a Sharpie, just take an Expo marker, a dry erase marker, and draw over it, and then you can erase them both together, because the dry erase marker uses the same solvents as the permanent marker. How cool is that? Solvents, everybody. They're radical. Don't buy these. Do not buy Mr. Clean Magic Erasers. Don't do it. Because all they are is melamine foam. Melamine is a super common chemical that's used to make all sorts of things, and all they do is blow it up into a foam. This is melamine foam. This is why magic erasers work. There's no cleaner in them. This is just super abrasive. And you can rub it on stuff, and it's abrasive enough to scratch off all the dirt and grime, but it's also tiny enough to break down and not, like, scuff and scratch things. So you could keep spending eight bucks to get like three magic erasers at the store, 
or you can just go online and buy bulk melamine foam sponges. I bought a hundred of these for 10 bucks. I'll put the thing in the thing. I haven't run out in over a year. It's the same thing. Just learn chemistry and save money. What kind of scientist you are? What is it that you study? And then how did you get into... I just got to work and I am the only one here today. So this is the perfect time to record this. This is Dr. Miriam Bellmaker's Paleoecology and Zooarchaeology Laboratory, and it looks like this. So my background is in integrative biology, which means that I didn't just specialize in one specific kind of biology. I studied all sorts of different fields within biology, all at the same time, in order to get a really big picture understanding of how life works. And then I threw in a bunch of chemistry, and a bunch of physics, and a bunch of astronomy as well, in order to really understand what life even is. But then I concentrated in organismic biology, which means I looked at everything through the lens of evolution, and I tried to study individual organisms to figure out why they are the way they are. Also, during my undergrad, I did a bunch of independent field research in vertebrate paleontology and human anatomy. And that's really important because now I work in a field called bioanthropology, where I take all of that background in organismic biology, in evolution, in ecology, and I apply it to humans. I'm trying to figure out the biology of our species, specifically where we came from and what makes us so weird. So as far as what kind of scientist I am, you could just call me an evolutionary biologist because I study human evolution for a living, and that's a way easier way to explain all of that stuff that I just said. Quick lab tour before I show you my research. These are all bones here. So these are bones and bones and bones and bones and bones and a fridge full of dead animals don't open that and bones and bones and bones and bones and <laughs> this is the skull of an american black bear this one's a spotted hyena a bobcat a raccoon this box is full of a goat this is a whale vertebra pardon me could you please pass the platter of scapulas and check it out, these are your ancestors. Here's the Ardipithecines, the Australopithecines, the Paranthropines, all the way through the Homo lineage, from Homo habilis to Homo erectus. Here's the Neanderthals, all the way up to our species, Homo sapiens. This is the species that I study. It's called Homo erectus. And the population that I'm researching right now lived one and a half million years ago. And I'm learning about them in a really cool way. You see, we find these Homo erectus bones in a really important place just outside of Africa. And we want to know what they were doing there. So my job is to do what's called paleoecological reconstruction, which means rebuilding these ancient ecosystems. And I do that by testing other animal bones like this deer jaw for special atoms called stable isotopes. And those isotopes allow me to figure out what the climate was like and what kind of plants this deer was eating while it was alive. And that lets me put together the entire ecosystem that our ancestors were living in one and a half million years ago. And as far as your last question about what got me into all of this, I think a better question is how could anybody not get into all of this? Science is awesome and it's for everybody. So if you want to learn about the universe, don't let anybody stop you. I frequently get asked to talk about the fact that sharks are older than trees, which is true. Sharks evolved around 450 million years ago, whereas trees evolved around 350 million years ago. So sharks predate trees by around 100 million years. And that's crazy cool to think about. But you know what's even cooler? Saturn didn't originally have rings. In fact, it existed without rings for billions of years after it formed. It wasn't until one of its icy moons ventured just a little bit too close to the planet that it got shredded by Saturn's immense gravity and smeared its mass all around the circumference of the planet, forming the beautiful ring system that we see today. And that happened somewhere between 10 and 100 million years ago. So both sharks and trees are older than Saturn's rings. And so are mammals and bees and most, if not all, dinosaurs. In fact, if we're close to the 10 million side, primates are also older than Saturn's rings. Now that's wild. Would we refer to people born on each one of our planets? Nobody's seen the big picture here. It's not for us to decide what to call them. It is for them to decide what to call themselves when the time is right. When is the time right? Think about this. When the very first baby 
is born on another planet. From that moment onward, we must now all change our birth certificates and our passports to include planet of origin. Because up until that point, that wasn't a question. But now it is. And that's when the conversation gets started. But it gets serious when the second generation is born on those planets. Because those kids are going to ask the really big question, if I was born here and my parents were born here, what do I owe the planet Earth anymore? And that's when the revolution starts. That's when the war of planetary independence begins. And we can be a part of a conflict that isn't going to happen for at least a century today. Martian independence now! Woo!